I was born and raised as a Christian. My mother um, and father divorced when I was about three years old, so um, I live with my mother, and so any religious teachings I pretty much got from my mom. She wasn't extremely strict in terms of religion, um, but she considered herself to be Catholic more than anything, even though I did frequent um, Methodist, Baptist church. I went to undergraduate school at, in Greensboro, North Carolina, and that's when my journey towards Islam began. I didn't know it at the time, but it started then. And the professor told me something that wrecked my faith in Christianity. He told me the book that you have in your hand is a book written by the hands of men and women throughout thousands and thousands of years and that writings have been passed on through the most rudimentary of fashions and through those rudimentary fashions we have lost some things some things have been added some things have been changed some things have been fixed but then changed again and some things have been fixed but they weren't fixed back to the original they were fixed the change was fixed by another change and what happened at the end is that we lost the original and the scholars have done the best that they can to come back to what is most likely the best original that we can have or what the authors may have thought when they wrote down the, those, those documents. But it is what it is. And you know what I told him? I asked him, I said, is God perfect? He said, yes, without a doubt. No Christian will tell you that God is not perfect. I said, if God is perfect, then everything emanating from Him will be perfect. Everything coming from Him will be perfect. If He has a book, it will be perfect. And since this book is not perfect, it is not from God. He will have prophets that are perfect in the sense that we understand perfection with God. These prophets are far from it. Therefore, they either are wrong or they can't be from God. If God has a religion, it has to be perfect. And for you to tell me and try to explain to me that the Trinity is a, un, um, a mystery that cannot be understood, then this is not perfection because it cannot be understood. And in me, as, a, as an old man, I couldn't understand it. You can't understand it. Nobody can understand it. Therefore, this can't be from God. So I left Christianity. So we decided that we were going to read the Bible for ourselves one more time just to get to the bottom of what it is that we believed. While I was in grad school, I was working part-time and in comes a Muslim lady. And I explained to her what my husband and I were doing. We were reading the Bible and because she had converted to Islam, she understood a lot of what I was going through. She even invited me to the masjid and I remember my first um, in anticipation of going to the masjid for the first time, I sat up all night long and I made my first hijab. And I walked out and I had it on and it felt perfect. I had my first Ramadan, Eid, um, which is the end of Ramadan, the celebration that Muslims have, um, it was on my birthday. So that was like really cool for me, having that experience. But again, my fiance, he wasn't Muslim yet. My husband, fiance at the time, um, he had started going to the masjid, going to Juma prayer, talking to my co-worker's husband who was Muslim, and he embraced Islam as well. So it was like this great gift given to me. And my conversion to Islam was very, it was very intellectual. Upon reading the Quran, learning more about Islam, how the pieces of the puzzle all the holes that were there for me as a Christian were filled. It settled in my heart in such a way, it was so peaceful, it was like, aha, that makes sense. It really made sense. And specifically around the personage of Jesus. The biggest concerns that I had was number one, not rejecting Jesus. And Islam doesn't. Um, so I had at the time a very, very negative image of Islam. Uh, because of the media and everything, I had a really bad image of Islam. I never thought about converting to Islam or anything like that. And just like, hearing about it or just the Quran, I would get scared. I just didn't want to have anything to do with the religion. But I didn't have a problem with the people for as long as they don't talk to me about religion. And so I went over to their place and they were fasting. <laughs> I think it's really hard to convert people. <laughs> Like, 
Muslims find my story really inspiring and maybe somebody who's interested in Islam will find it inspiring but it's not really our job anyway to convert people because Is it not? Doesn't say in the Quran Well, that I mean, was part. only Allah can guide who He wills you could give somebody a million pieces of evidence of why the Quran is 100% true and the real last book of Allah but even then their own stubbornness and the, the veil that's been put over their hearts by Allah can't be lifted by us of course it's our job to give right information and where is asked to inspire and to show what a good Muslim is and where the truth of Islam lies but I mean, if they're not meant to come to Islam, there's nothing really we can do about it. And I think that's the hardest part. I mean, if you see somebody has a very open heart, yeah, do your best, but don't push. Never force. Because anybody who's pushed into something won't, won't do it well. As opposed to maybe to sound a bit full of myself, but me, like I really dove into it because it was fully my choice. Tons of people have told me about Islam for years and years, and I didn't care. I was whatever I'm not gonna join this and it has nothing to do with me and it's all lies or astaghfirullah azim <laughs> but um, yeah I think if that person's willing to know and willing to open their heart yeah do all we can to show them the truth and tell from our own stories and use the Quran as evidence to back it up because people relate more to something they know is real as opposed to what they know has been in a book when I have an opportunity to speak to Americans about Islam, I tell them that Islam is a religion of peace. It is a religion of submission to the Creator. And it is a religion of tolerance. I quickly tell them, and I want them to know, that Islam does not condone the killing of anyone unjustly, and certainly does not condone war in the fashion that we're hearing about it today. It, it would be a very poor religion if it didn't teach you to defend yourself. But our religion teaches peace and tolerance and our prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, endeavored for 13 years to avoid war. And that's what we should be doing today. We should be looking to build alliances with people and to have peace with all people. I used to go out in the garden and just like what, look at the stars at night and just think who created these stars like it's just such a perfect creation when I was about nine years old I started going to church now nobody in my family went to church and uh, my father really didn't like that he used to tell me all the time how can you believe that God has a son he just did not like that is like God is independent and God needs no son however I was I was a really stubborn girl and um, I always wanted I was very curious I wanted to learn things I wanted to know things so I kept going there and my parents never um, stopped me from doing that because they raised me um, to be independent and to make decisions for myself so Basically, my father would show me what is wrong and what's right, and then let me make a decision. That religion, either way I was happy. To me, it wasn't a real religion, it was barbaric. The Muslims were crazy, nutcases. <laughs> they were just people that would terrorize innocent people, they would blow up buildings. So for me, I was glad. I didn't think that I would ever become Muslim, that I would ever entertain the idea of Islam. So it's quite ironic now. <laughs> I am, I am a Muslim. And I did read a book about Islam and it said that Muslims worshipped a moon god that lived in a box in the desert in Saudi Arabia and that they had many wives whom they beat as a sport and that the greatest thing a Muslim could do was to kill a non-Muslim and they would get virgins when he went to heaven. So, you know, Islam, I didn't care about what evidences you guys had. You know, you were the most backward, ignorant, stupid people on the earth. Um, and, and the only person that I ever knew about being a Muslim was Ramzi Yusuf because of the 93 World Trade Center bombings and I don't know if any of you saw the mugshot they used for him he looked like the most scary individual on the face of the globe and Osama bin Laden and there is no good picture ever published about him he always looks like he's ready to eat your children so I, I was afraid of all of you everything I used to believe in was changing I was really asking basic questions about me, my life, my family what I want in my life uh, why I'm here 
it was time to actually open the Quran and read the Quran. And I was watching for half an hour before I opened the first time the Quran. I don't know why. I, I read in the other book about the Prophet's life that you have to wash before you read the Quran. And I kept on washing and I had a shower. <laughs> and I washed again my hands. And I was really scared to touch this book because I, I felt I have to respect the other religion. I don't want to be disrespecting to them. And I just opened it and I started to read in Surah, Surah Al-Baqarah. I just finished it to the half and I convert to Islam. As a Christian, you really focus a lot on the New Testament and Jesus. That within Christianity, there are supposed to be laws and ways in which Christians were supposed to live their daily lives. I didn't see that growing up. I never practiced a lot of the things that I read in the Old Testament. The oneness of God was very clear to me in the Old Testament. And that was in great contrast to what I saw in the New Testament. Um, the New Testament was void of law and how a Christian was supposed to live their daily life. Of course, within Christian teachings there, don't steal, don't lie, <clears throat> don't commit murder, all of these things, but the actual day-to-day -day worship of God, your relationship with God, how do you cultivate that? It was missing for me. I was really shocked because I had a completely different image of Muslim women. I thought they were conservative and I was just so shocked. Like, I'm like, why are these women doing these things? Like, is this how Muslim women actually are? So I just go home and uh, I wanted, that's like the first part. I wanted to know what Islam is all about, what these women are all about, because I hear in the media that they're very conservative. And then I went home and I researched it and I was like, this is so much hypocrisy that I couldn't even swallow it. And that's how I got exposed to Islam. I did not know at the time that all it takes for someone to be a Muslim or to be called a Muslim is for them to declare that there is no God but God and uh, Muhammad, um, peace be upon him, is his prophet, believe in the, in the angels and the holy books. Um, but I didn't know that there are a lot of Muslim people who do things that um, are completely against religion. Do you believe in? I didn't know anything about Islam and I was amazed to know that, that in Islam, Maryam, the Virgin Mary in, in Catholicism, was a very important woman, one of the fourth most important women in Islam. And that Jesus, Isa, was a very important prophet, and that they had the same prophets that uh, I, I grew up uh, knowing in, in, the, in the Christianity. So I, I didn't know that, so I was really mesmerized. I felt like, we are so close. I didn't know. I just heard always from the news, you know, these people are doing things that are wrong. So I started to, to want to know more about Islam. I remember going to the priest in the university and, and uh, asking him, what do you think about these questions I have? And I, I felt there was no answer. And and then if I would go to Islam, I would see like it's so clear and pure and, and uh, it, everything is there. It's, it's so close, but it completely started to answer all my questions. What I've learned since my conversion to Islam is that it's a, it's a pure religion. There's no middleman. In Christianity, everybody always prays. When they pray, majority of Christians pray to Jesus. Why? Why are you going to pray to a person in the middle when you can have, you got direct contact with God? He's the one that's going to be the overall decider of what goes on, what, what you get, what you don't get, what happens to you. Why go through a middleman? I took a year from the time my first involvement with Islam, and I started reading. You never want to jump into it too, too openly. You want to make sure you're, you're fully aware of what Islam is about. So that's why I did. I took and read books. I started learning the true Islam, the beauty of it, the simplicity of it. And it just opened my heart. And then December 1998 in Florida, I took and submitted and converted to Islam. I became a Muslim because I was searching for truth. And truth for me would mean that I was integrity with what I understood. Uh, as a young child, about the age of 10, I remember looking at my grandmother and saying, you know, God is very upset with us today. All of these songs are about Jesus, and we haven't sung anything about Him yet. And she looked at me and she said, yes, there are a lot of things I don't understand either. 
So um, I was, you know, I was studying to be a minister as a young child. I started preaching at the age of 10. And uh, there were questions that I had at an early age. Um, I wanted the truth and I knew the truth would make me free. And one of the biggest questions w were questions concerning the Trinity, which I did not understand. There were too many scriptures that contradicted that concept. And also the canonization of the Bible. And these were questions that I had as early as 12 years of age. I think it's more the media perception of Muslims that make people turn away from the idea of ever coming to Islam or even looking to be interested possibly in it. I think a lot of Muslims do give a bad perception of Islam too, but I mean you can't judge something based on everything. I study Christianity, I study Buddhism. Mainly I don't like human influence <laughs> of religion, which is why I don't base my opinion of religion on people because if you follow what people are doing then you're never gonna see the truth you need to really study it and yeah before I converted I read the Quran well I read half of it in Ramadan but I did a lot of research before I put a lot of things into practice such as patience and I, I saw the benefits and the fruits of Islam come back to me before I decided SubhanAllah Allah sent me a lot of blessings to show me what's the miracle of Islam so yeah I did study a lot and I did make sure that I read at least half the Quran before I converted because stepping into a religion isn't something small. And I saw for the first time the prayer of Islam and it was the most beautiful thing I, I had encountered until the moment to see how people were all standing in lines and doing the same movements at the same time and and then to hear the Quran for the first time for me was like a kinesthetic experience. I remember feeling like I, I was embraced and uh, it, it was something really out of this world. I, I felt I need to listen more of this and I need to know more about this religion because I, I really, really love how, how it looks and how it feels. It was for me that really the spirituality was there uh, and I wanted more of it. And then I had the opportunity to, to compare both. And for me it was clear that what really the connection with the, with the only God was, was in this, in this Islam. So, um, so I kept going to church, I used to go two to three times a week. I used to even teach the Bible to the little kids and I really loved it. I loved the people at church. But then there was always a void in my heart. Like, I could not explain it. Like why, why I have this religion, I'm reading the Bible, but there are still things that I, I keep wondering about and I can't find answers to. Um, and then later on I moved to the States and um, there I continued going to church. Before that, I tried different churches. I, was, um, I went to Orthodox Church, to a Protestant church. Um, in the States then, I tried different churches as well. And um, I used to do that every week. However, I had a lot of questions I couldn't find the answers to. For example, the Trinity. I couldn't wrap my head around that. I couldn't understand it. How does it work? And every time I try to ask, ask questions, the answers are not satisfying. People are just like, oh, well, that's the way it is, right? You just believe in it. Memories from my childhood, uh, you know, of course, like celebrating um, Christmas and Easter. Uh, there was always like, you know, the, the Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny aspect of those holidays. And then you also have the, the more religious uh, view of those holidays as well. And, you know, I, um, our family, we did celebrate the, the more religious views of those holidays. Um, and I do have a lot of fond memories of, you know, praying uh, with my grandmother, um, you know, praying for our relatives that have passed away, um, also praying the rosary as well. Um, I would say that I did um, happily identify myself as a Catholic at the time. Um, we, we did read the Bible, um, you know, we learned it in, in church on weekends. Um, but I would say that I identified myself as a Catholic quite happily. Um, you know, um, my relationship um, with, you know, uh, Jesus, uh, peace be upon him, you know, as a Catholic was, was a pretty strong one at the time growing up. Um, I would say that daily prayers were absolutely important. Um, 
you know, I couldn't go to sleep without, you know, praying that night or else I would have like a guilty conscience. It just became like a, a habit that I had since, you know, as I grew up, even as I became, you know, a little bit more distant from the religion and, you know, didn't attend church every Sunday um, as I got older. Um, but I did always pray. It, that is something that I always kept uh, as a daily thing. Um, my views of Islam uh, prior to converting, um, I was... I was a teenager, of course, at the time, so I didn't really have uh, a lot of knowledge of, you know, different religions. Uh, I would just, you know, the media did influence a lot of my opinion. Uh, I was quite ignorant to the religion and what it stood for and, you know, what Islam really was. Um, I just felt like it was something really foreign. Um, of course, I had, uh, you know, all the misrepresentations of the religion. I did have a negative view towards it uh, based on the media and all the events that had happened. Um, you know, for example, like, you know, the events of 9-11, you know, right away you see like this is a, you know, Islam is labeled on this type of thing. So when someone's ignorant of the religion, you're going to look at an event like that and say, well, why would the religion condone this? You know, why would Muslims condone this? Um, so for sure I did have a negative view, you know, which was of course all misrepresented, but I did have a negative view of Islam prior, um, you know, as a teenager. So I got down on my hands and knees again. And I said, God, I never thought that that, that, that that prayer of asking you to show me the truth would have led me here. <laughs> I would have never in a million billion years thought I would find you in a book called the Quran that was given to me by some Arab guy named Muhammad. Never. But nevertheless, here I am. And I'm willing to accept it, whatever it is. And if you want me to be a Muslim, I don't know how I'm going to do that because I can't be an Arab and I can't, you know, I can't do all of these other things that they're doing. But I'll try my best. So I went to the Imam on the next day and I went to his house because the masjid was locked and he lived right behind the house. I knocked on his door, he opened it and I interrogated him. I said, where did you get this book? He said, it is from God. I said, any, any dummy that looks at it and reads it can tell that. I said, but where did you get it? He said, it was passed on to us, you know, century by century from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I said, I want to be a Muslim. He said, what? I said, I want to be a Muslim. He said, why? I said, because the book says I'm supposed to be a Muslim. He said, whoa, whoa, hold on a second, just slow down. To be a Muslim, you have to believe two things. Number one, that God is one alone. So I've always believed that, even though I had it a little bit twisted for a while, I've always believed that God was one. He said, okay, but that's only half of the picture. You have to also believe in the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So why don't you come in, sit down, and let me tell you about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I told him, I said, no, no, no. I want you to answer me a question about Muhammad, peace be upon him. He said, what? I said, did he give us this book? He said, yes. I said, then he is a prophet. Then he is who he says he is because God is perfect. The book is perfect. Therefore, the medium between God and the book has to be just as perfect. So I took my shahada in December of 1998, uh, over 13 years ago. And one, one thing that I said to myself is that I would not be like the Muslims <laughs> in the mosque that I came from. <laughs> Somebody's out there looking for the truth, living on the same street that these people were worshipping on. And it took me this roundabout way that I had to go all the way to the deep depths of darkness and ignorance in order to come and find them. I, tried to, I, I made it a commitment to myself that I would do the best of my ability for the rest of my life to make sure no one had to struggle to come to the truth the way I came to the truth. There was very little information about Islam at this time and I wanted to change that to the best of my abilities and you better believe when I found out that there was a profession in Islam called Da'wah and that this was an honored and glorified profession and its, and its entire goal was that's what I decided to become and I will not change that insha'Allah for anything that comes in between me and it to, the, to my dying breath insha'Allah. My name is Petra. Um, I embraced Islam one year ago when I was 33. I came from Czech Republic. Well, when I was born it was Czechoslovakia and my hometown is Kladno, which is the biggest uh, nearest city to Prague. Uh, my family, well, um, we I, don't, I cannot say we were religious because back in communism there was um, the support of uh, the church was not there. So people who wanted to be religious, they were practicing mostly at home and not openly. So in our family, we were celebrating Christmas and Easter, but we didn't know or I was not told how to pray. There was no Sunday school uh, when I was a um, kid or any re religious studies at school, so I was not um, 
com like exposed to any religious activities. Um, we didn't go to church even during Christmas. We just it was just a family gathering and happy times when we were exchanging gifts. The first time I got exposed to religious people and um, people who were praying was when I came to UAE. That was in 2007. And I was working in an airline. And whenever we took off with the plane, I saw my colleagues sitting next to me praying. Either they would make the cross and they would pray they were Christians or um, because it was Arabic airline, before every takeoff, there was uh, a prayer showing before they will start doing the safety video. So hearing the prayer before every takeoff, it has an impact on you. Like you already know the words and you are looking forward because then everything had to stop. We couldn't do any service and we were just there sitting and waiting. So these moments, like I would like inside me say, in like let's have a good flight and safe flight and come back safe. So I did it for seven years. All these inside prayers, like make this flight safe, let us all be safe. But I didn't know the meaning and the reasons or why, so I was just doing it. And then with all my friends around here that I made, some of them were Muslims, so I sta started to ask questions and be interested more in the reasons. Um, what is the purpose? Why they are doing this? Uh, why they are not celebrating other holidays but only eat? Like, why is that? Uh, so by getting the answers, I was um, slowly more attracted to Islam, like my heart got open and alhamdulillah, that was the way how I slowly started to learn and comparing also other religions because coming from or being seeing Christian Christianity as the biggest religion, I was trying to get the differences between Christianity and Islam. Leaning forward to what was true like in Islam, um, it made m everything made, m made more sense. So, and Islam is teaching like everybody should know, everybody should know how to pray. Like you don't need a priest to forgive you. You can, you, it's just you and your relationship with Allah that he will be the most forgiving whatever you are doing. So it's your relationship with him. You don't need anybody in the middle. When we as Christians look at the concept of the oneness of God, we have apostolic Christians who say there's one God, and then we have the majority of Christians that say that Jesus is God, that you know God is God, and then he sent himself in the form of a man, in the flesh, which was Jesus, and then he's his word, which was the Bible. Um, in Islam, of course, we know that there is nothing comparable to God. And there are 352 scriptures in the Bible that contradict the notion of Trinitarian doctrine. The word Trinity does not exist in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, from the first book to the last book. Um, I did my thesis in Bible college at the age of 15 entitled, Jesus Christ is not God. Needless to say, I was not asked to come back. Um, but this was one of the greatest blessings to me was to find and understand how how could the creator be compared to the creation you know um, and this of course was was one of the greatest blessings of finding Islam for me because it all made sense all my life I believed firmly that which the Old Testament teaches thou shalt have no other gods before me and how could we then have pictures of Jesus in the church if we weren't supposed to have any graven images, if we weren't supposed to have any gods before us, how could we pray to him? And then the uh, testaments tell us that he's a jealous God. And if he's jealous and we're singing about this other guy called Jesus, there's something wrong with the story. So, um, so from there on in I thought, well, I've learned about the real religions they're a load of rubbish, I don't believe in them, so I just carried on. I just became a normal Scottish teenager. I done what you would expect of any sort of British teenager. I went out clubbing, I drank alcohol, just had a laugh, just 
there was there was no point to looking back I just think at that time I thought that's what you did with your life but it, to me now it just seems it just seems pointless and where my journey into Islam began was I in 2005 I started working in a call centre and in that call centre it was predominantly Pakistani people that were in there that were Muslims and they were not crazy. <laughs> they were not anything that I had imagined that the media had portrayed. Um, and in actual fact, they became my best friends. I was a model when I was 15. I wasn't very professional, but you saw me in some cover shoots or in some uh, catwalk shows. I was presenting once the, the, the beachwear of Brazilian uh, breachwear. And I remember this day that they told me, oh, you got on some weight. We cannot use you for the next shooting. And I, I just felt ashamed. I felt, what's the right to speak about my body like that? I, I, I'm a personality. It's not. I'm just not a product. And I feel that even in the in the commercials and and, and everywhere, they they say sex sells, and they use actually this as an instrument just to sell their product. I don't want to be used as an object. And uh, before I was even veiled, I just covered up my body because I felt the eyes of men. I felt they eat me because I used to. <laughs> I, used to, I, I felt I was pretty and they're really eating me when I'm wearing the bikini at the beach and I wanted to wear long sleeve and I started to go even in the pool wearing a t-shirt because I really felt ashamed of how they look at me and just feel wow, oh la la, like uh, who's that girl? My name is Sandra and I, and I embraced Islam 10 years ago at the age of 31. I was born in Colombia and I was born into a Catholic family. Since a very young age, I was very involved in the church and especially in the choirs. At the age of six, I started singing in all the Christmas events and Easter events and I was pretty much into it. And uh, that's how my life developed. I was very close to the church, especially anything that had to be with music, I was into it. I joined a choir, a children choir, and I was being always um, active in the church. So when I finished my high school, I, I realized the love I had for music and I wanted to move forward to it. And I knew I had a very, very strong potential as a singer. I had been done a lot of uh, like um, solo singing in classical repertoire. I was um, very much involved in, in a lot of le Colombian level musical performances. So I joined the musical program to develop myself as an opera singer. And I finished my career as an opera singer in Colombia. Then I moved to Austria. I, I, I was accepted to, to enter in the Vienna Conservatory. And then there was, I was exposed for the first time to what the real life of music was. Um, I was very, very dedicated in my music, but I was always feeling an emptiness in me. Uh, of course, I, I moved alone. I, I went by myself and I was living with friends. Um, but always my, my family was not there, you know, uh, so I would always feel like I had the voice of my family and telling me keep connected to, to your faith. So I remember every day going through the conservatory, I will stop and I will go and enter into the church and I remember my, my impression going inside and seeing all these statues and seeing people mainly with white hair. You would never barely see young people there. Uh, although the places were amazing, it was really like a piece of art, but there was no soul inside of them. But I just wanted to keep connected to my family and to what I was as a child, connected to the church. So I will keep on going. And um, I remember going inside the church and feeling like, okay, there's this Mary looks beautiful today. Let's put a candle here and, and make a prayer here. And the next, the next day I will go and to another church and maybe there was a church with the name of a saint. So I will go and pray to the saint. And, and it was just, you know, starting to feel like it's really confusing to a saint or to the Virgin or to Jesus. I, I felt I was praying with the real, truly God. And I was saying, please guide me. I'm completely lost. I don't know what I should do with my life. So please, please guide me. And it was... A year. A year. Yeah, I've been Muslim for a year and I became veiled or with a hijab two weeks ago. Um, I actually came to this decision a few months ago. Uh, I didn't really understand it before that. I know it says it in the Quran that we should cover from our hair and from our wrists to our ankles. 
so um, but I was I was sitting at the, okay I went down to the pool one day I wanted to tan <laughs> so I went down in my dress and my bathing suit underneath and at the pool there was a whole Muslim family and the women were all at the side in their hijabs and in the shade and the men were in the pool having fun and playing and I felt so and at this point like I didn't know that these Islamic values were inside of me I was so shocked to see me feeling like this I was so shy to take off my dress. I didn't want to take the attention of their husbands. I didn't want to make them feel uncomfortable. And I ended up not taking off my dress. I put my feet in the water. I listened to music. And I, I was just thinking about why do I feel this way? And why does Allah ask us to cover? And it came to the conclusion that men are very visual, <laughs> as most men will tell you. And they, they pick their women a lot more based on looks than women pick their men. For women being a good sustainer, a provider, protection, caring, you know, these are all much more important for women than looks. So it, it kind of evens the playing field more. You know, it's, it's a gift, our beauty as women. We were made the beautiful of the two. You know, men are very like a board they're straight and you know they're not much to really look at actually physically so we were given this gift to be the beautiful creatures on earth and that gift should be saved for the one we love well when i think about the ten commandments and i think about the path that muslims follow what i find is that the muslims tend to follow that path in a stronger way than the christians that i knew um, the Christians that I know tend to focus on what they refer to as grace. So that it's okay if you follow these Ten Commandments, but Jesus Christ came to end the law, is what they say. Instead of to say that He came to fulfill the law, they say He came to end the law. So you really don't have to obey those things in the Christianity that I came from. They're there and they're good guidelines, but it's okay if you don't obey. Whereas in Islam, the boundaries that we need to establish an effective constructive life are there. And it's very clear that these boundaries are there. You need to implement them in your life. And if you don't implement them, the knowledge of them is useless. It's like uh, where the, the hadith that talks about the donkey, uh, one of the traditions of the prophet, we can take the donkey and put the books on his back, but they're no good to the donkey unless he implements the knowledge. And so Islam teaches us the importance of implementing that knowledge and practicing those commandments. And those commandments are certainly one and the same with that which Islam teaches. One thing that stood out, out to me was the fact that what they'd done was very respectful. They had a lot of respect for themselves. They wanted to have a good image. There was a lot of things they wouldn't do. So they wouldn't come out clubbing with me. You know, once I had a birthday, I invited them and they declined and I couldn't understand why. So slowly, slowly, it was just their behaviours, their mannerisms that introduced me to Islam. And that was a really profound moment for me. So something happened in that moment, I became curious. What are these Muslims doing? They're starving themselves and giving their food away to me. Like, who am I? Why are they doing this? And then I started having questions. You know, what is Islam? Why are they Muslim? You know, are, are these kind attributes that they have, um, their upbringing? Is it just these specific people? Is it part of Islam? What is it? And so I started to ask them questions. I started to inquire, be inquisitive. And something that really shook me is that they weren't proud. Well, I think this, or I feel this, or I know that. They said, this is what the Quran says, this is what the Sunnah says, this is what the Hadith says. They had proof for everything. And never at any point did they say to me, just believe, just have faith, we know this is the truth. They didn't tell me that, they, they gave me the answers. And when they didn't know the answers, they would go and find out. And they would be humble enough to admit, I don't know, I can't answer that, I can't tell you. So, here I was standing Islam in the face and it was the truth. I couldn't deny it was the truth but I wasn't ready to accept being a Muslim. I never wanted to adopt a religion I just wanted to know the answers and I thought that would be enough but in learning about Islam I realized that believing is not enough. Islam is a way of life. They've got their own economical, political, social, legal system 
if I was to become a Muslim, if I was to adopt that identity, everything I'd ever known would have to change. So as a Christian, uh, the perspective is that you can pretty much do whatever you want to. God will forgive you. He will have grace upon you. And if you have confessed with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe that God raised him from the dead, then you're going to be saved. That's Romans 10, 9, and 10. And that's it. The Islamic perspective of the Day of Judgment is that, first of all, when you become a Muslim, you do your confession of faith or your shahada, your profession of faith, um, and you declare the oneness of God, it comes into your head. And it's something that you know about. But as you pray and as you obey God, that moves into your heart. And then it moves into the limbs of your body. And your hands become the hands of God. Your eyes become the eyes of God. Your feet become the feet of God because they are in obedience to what God has commanded. And that is what is expected of a Muslim. He is in submission his whole being, his whole self, is in submission to God. And on the day of judgment as a Christian, as a Muslim, I'm sorry, on the day of judgment as a Muslim, our limbs are going to testify for or against us. Our eyes are going to say that whether we use those eyes to please God or whether we use them to serve ourselves, our ears, our hands, our, all of our body is going to betray us and say, you were born to serve God, but you chose to serve your lower desires, yourself. So there is a tremendous difference in the day of judgment view from a Christian and Muslim standpoint. I came across the Holy Quran, um, not necessarily like uh, in a specific event. Of course, um, when I had decided I was wanting to learn more about different religions and learn about Islam in particular. Um, of course, I did look to, you know, the Quran. I, I did a lot of online research where, of course, you see a lot of, you know, good and bad, of course. So I did prefer books at the time. Um, I was given an English version of the Quran, and um, this was all prior to me converting, I would say, a good year, a year and a half prior. Um, and, of course, I read it, you know, front to back, and yeah. <laughs> The particular verse that I would say that inspired me in the Quran um, was, uh, you know, the fact that there is a whole chapter named Miriam. Uh, of course, you know, as you know, coming from a Catholic background, you're like, oh, this is so familiar to me, you know. And then everything that you know, the specific verses that talk about uh, the Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, uh, of course, that you know, resonated with me, you know, coming from a Catholic background and, and the the concept of Jesus, I would say. You know, once I learned that from the Quran, I felt that it totally changed my whole aspect. You know, the, my whole view of being a Catholic was totally shattered uh, after reading uh, Surat Miriam. My view of hijab prior uh, prior to learning about Islam, um, I would see uh, Muslim women wearing it. I would assume that they were, you know, either forced to wear it or, you know, that it was some sort of, you know, written in stone rule that, you know, it's like maybe they didn't want to wear it, but they felt that they had to as Muslims. So. You know, of course, I didn't. I didn't really like the idea of anything that you know, where you're being told to do something. Of course, that that's viewed as something oppressive. Which you know, even today, there is that that misrepresentation still stands with a lot of people. You know, they see a woman in hijab, they assume that you know she's oppressed or she doesn't have equal rights. So, of course, I did have that those same views prior. But you know, now you know after looking into it, of course, um, you know, I look at the hijab as a totally different light, a totally different you know view where it's. You know, it's very liberating, you know, for a woman to wear hijab, and it's it's absolutely a choice. Whereas, I mean, it is it is written in the Quran. It is you know, all the, all the things that's required from us as Muslims. You know, there there are written things, but there's no compulsion in the religion. So of course, these are the type of things where y you would decide to do it for yourself, not because you're not convinced by it or you don't want to wear it. And we are made aware that when the last person leaves that grave, an angel is going to come and question our soul and ask us who our Lord is and who our prophet was and what our religion was. And we are going to need to be prepared for those questions. And then we will have this period of rest if we lived a good life and our graves will be opened up and they will be large and spacious filled with light and a wonderful scent of perfume from heaven. Whereas the Muslims teach, the, the Christians teach, I'm sorry, that when you die, you're dead, and you're of no knowledge. 
We as Muslims, when we die, we know what people are saying around us. We know what people are doing. We know if they're crying. We know what's going on. Um, and it's an interesting perspective as well because we as Muslims respect the body of the dead so much more than from the Christian perspective. We as Muslims wash our own dead and we treat them with tremendous respect. Whereas in the Christian tradition, uh, fingernails are clipped and uh, all kinds of things are done to the body to make it look beautiful and then it's laid out on display. Whereas Islamically, we return back to the earth with what we came with, pretty much with nothing. We're wrapped in sheep, sort of like we're wrapped in diapers as babies. Um, and the whole experience uh, of death Islamically is so much richer to me because I know what I'm going to face there. And knowing what I'm going to face there and knowing the questions allows me to feel more prepared for that. I said, my dear God, this guy Musa has sold me to these Arabs. <laughs> he sold me to these Arabs like you sell, you know, uh, a lamb to slaughter. He sold me and they're going to do their little jihad after their Juma thing. and They're going to get their virgins. I said, that's it. No, no, no. It's time for me to leave. You know, I'm not an idiot. I'm getting out of here. So I get up to leave and everybody gets quiet. So I sit back down. I said, okay, hold on a second. <laughs> I realize this because there's a guy that's got up on the stairs and it's the same guy that invited me in. Soft-spoken. I mean, he was almost whispering. Very short, small, meek, weak, you know, guy. He gets up and I say, okay, I'm going to let him get started and then I'm going to, you know, just make my way out while everybody's focused on him. You know, I, I really did not comprehend that the first thing to come out of his mouth was, let's get him. You know, that's, that, it can't start like that. There has to be some, you know, lead up to it or whatever. He gets on the membar and he starts his thing. I'm like, oh my dear God. He's telling them to kill me for sure. Because now he's screaming in Arabic. He's pounding on the little, you know, plat thing in front of him and he's pointing in my direction. It's over with. My translation in my head, let's get this dirty American and let's cut his head off and kill him. And I said, it's over. I have to go. The only thing missing from this scenario is for the curtain to come back and the women to start going la, 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 la. You know, the, the sword comes out, the bucket with the heads. I say, okay. I start looking at the, the most weak of the group in front of me, the Arab guys. I'm going to hit him and then I'm going to run. I'm going to cause a distraction, a disturbance, and I'm getting out of here. You know, I'm fighting my way out. There's, I'm not going out like this. You know, I'm, I live on this road. You know, you can't be serious. <laughs> So I can see my house from the window. You know, I'm not going to die today. So I decide, who am I going to hit? You know, and I'm picking up my path of least resistance out of here. I'm thinking about going through the curtain. Then I'm like, no way. I'm not, you don't, you don't mess with women in a group whatsoever. And that might be where they keep the swords anyway. And there might not be a way out back there. That might be a death trap. So I'm going to knock these guys out because there's only one entrance and I have to go through all of those guys to get to it. So right before I get up and I get the nerve to get up and start, you know, flipping out in the masjid, which alhamdulillah I did not, the imam stopped screaming in Arabic and he started to translate what he said into English. All praise belongs to the one true God, the creator of all that exists. We praise him and we praise him alone. We seek his help and his help alone. We ask for his forgiveness and his forgiveness alone. Whomsoever the creator guides to the truth, no one can misguide him from it. And whomsoever the Creator leads astray from the truth, he cannot be led back to it except by his Creator. And he said, I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except the one true God of all that exists. And I bear witness that Muhammad is indeed a slave and messenger. And you all know how the rest goes. O oh, you who believe, fear God as is his due right and do not die unless you are submitting to him. O oh, mankind, fear your guardian Lord who created you from a single soul and from that soul its mate and from them two men and men and women. You know, how the rest of the translation goes. This caught my attention because I had never heard rhetoric like this. Never, ever. Nothing I had ever heard was like this. And to me, it really didn't fit with all the screaming and yelling. I, you know, I, I really didn't see the need for that. It was very eloquent what he was saying. And then his sermon. So I said, let me sit down. He's not telling, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe, you know, I'm overreacting. Let me sit down and just listen. If they say kill him, then, then I'll start hitting. His whole sermon on that day the khutbah was on the forgiveness of Allah. 
the forgiveness of the Creator, that the forgiveness of the Creator is so massive and expansive that the human intellect cannot comprehend it. And that out of all of God's creation, He was saying that only a portion of it was sent to His creation. And without that, not even a single living thing would exist. And there was something He said that God's door to forgiveness is open at any time, at any place, without discretion for anyone. And that there were only three ways, three ways that the human being could not be forgiven. He said the first way was if someone knowingly worships something other than God. Now this is starting to remind me of the God of the Old Testament. He said number two, if the soul has reached the throat and the angel of death has presented himself to you, after that there's no more forgiveness. And he said third, some of the major signs of the day of resurrection, such as the sun rising from the west, the dab coming out from the earth, these, the, you know, the, these things, the smoke. Uh, he said after these, when the day of resurrection begins to commence, after this there's no more forgiveness. Other than that, he said God is the most forgiving. And he quoted a story of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, about Angel Gabriel, alayhi salam, where Jibreel, and, 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 and I'm narrating and summarizing the story for you. Told the Prophet, peace be upon him, tell the Muslims that Allah says if they, for, if, they, if they steal, Allah will forgive them. And so he went and told the Muslims, if you steal, Allah will forgive you. So they would ask, okay, well what about if I, you know, kill somebody? Well, Allah forgive that. And he would go to ask Jibreel, Jibreel would come back and say, yes, Allah forgives that too, forgives this, forgives that. And then finally, Jibreel alayhi salam summed up, that's what it said. Tell them this, and this is another hadith that no matter how many sins they have committed, no matter if their sins are massive enough to fill the earth and everything that is in it, if they meet their Creator having worshipped nothing but Him alone, seeking His forgiveness and hoping for His reward, that they will find a Creator who will meet them with the like amount of forgiveness. I was just completely shocked because no issue of forgiveness is like this in any other religion. It's just not there. That unique relationship that is a personal relationship between you and your Creator, forgiveness. So after the sermon, or when the Muslims stood up to pray, I caught my attention because I know that this was the way of the prayer of the prophets. Moses prayed like this, Abraham prayed like this, David prayed like this, Jesus prayed like this. They bowed and they prostrated to God. This was worship. I knew this was not prayer. This is worship. This is ritual, formal worship of God. So I got down on my hands and knees again and I said, God, I never thought that that, 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 that prayer of asking you to show me the truth would have led me here. <laughs> I would have never in a million billion years thought I would find you in a book called the Quran that was given to me by some Arab guy named Muhammad. Never. But nevertheless, here I am. And I'm willing to accept it, whatever it is. And if you want me to be a Muslim, I don't know how I'm going to do that because I can't be an Arab and I can't, you know, I can't do all of these other things that they're doing, but I'll try my best. So I went to the Imam on the next day. And I went to his house because the masjid was locked and he lived right behind the house. I knocked on his door, he opened it and I interrogated him. I said, where did you get this book? He said, it is from God. I said, any, any dummy that looks at it and reads it can tell that. I said, but where did you get it? He said, it was passed on to us, you know, century by century from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I said, I want to be a Muslim. He said, what? I said, I want to be a Muslim. He said, why? I said, because the book says I'm supposed to be a Muslim. He said, whoa, whoa, hold on a second, just slow down. To be a Muslim, you have to believe two things. Number one, that God is one alone. So I've always believed that, even though I had it a little bit twisted for a while, I've always believed that God was one. He said, okay, but that's only half of the picture. You have to also believe in the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So why don't you come in, sit down, and let me tell you about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I told him, I said, no, no, no. I want you to answer me a question about Muhammad, peace be upon him. He said, what? I said, did he give us this book? He said, yes. I said, then he is a prophet. Then he is who he says he is because God is perfect. The book is perfect. Therefore, the medium between God and the book has to be just as perfect. So I took my shahada in December of 1998, uh, over 13 years ago. And one, one thing that I said to myself is that I would not be like the Muslims <laughs> in the mosque that I came from. <laughs> Somebody's out there looking for the truth, living on the same street that these people were worshipping on. And it took me this roundabout way that I had to go all the way to the deep depths of darkness and ignorance in order to come and find them. I, tried to, I, I made it a commitment to myself that I would 
do the best of my ability for the rest of my life to make sure no one had to struggle to come to the truth the way I came to the truth. There was very little information about Islam at this time and I wanted to change that to the best of my abilities and you better believe when I found out that there was a profession in Islam called Da'wah and that this was an honored and glorified profession and its, and its entire goal was that's what I decided to become and I will not change that insha'Allah for anything that comes in between me and it to, the, to my dying breath insha'Allah